Thank you, Betty. Uh, the pleasure for me, as you know, um, <clears throat> not only is uh, Kyle Pickett uh, our speaker today, he is also uh, a fellow Rotarian, belongs to the Springfield, Missouri Rotary Club. Topeka Symphony was formed in 1946 at Topeka Civic Orchestra by Warspern Professor Everett Fetter. The first performance featured 60 talented townspeople as well as Warspern University and Topeka High students. Since that time, it has just grown and grown and grown. Kyle Wally Pickett was chosen as only the fourth conductor in the 67-year history of the Topeka Symphony Orchestra. Maestro Pickett took the stage in October of 2013. Wiley Pickett has established himself as a triple threat music director, a talented and visionary musician who has earned the respect of players, soloists, boards, and audiences. He has an excellent track record of orchestra building and great cultural leader in the communities in which he serves. Kyle Pickett is a native of Los Gatos, California. He holds a bachelor's degree in music from Stanford University and a master's degree in choral conducting from the California State University of Chico. His doctorate of music, arts degree in orchestra conducting was conferred by the Peabody Ops, uh, Conservatory in Baltimore. He is also an accomplished uh, flute player. He not only conducts the Topeka Symphony, he also conducts the Springfield Symphony in Missouri. This summer, the symphony performed on the Oregon Trail, as you many know, many of you know, from up north here at Marysville, and uh, had nearly 2,000 people in attendance. And uh, in talking to him, it looks like this may be an annual event. He and his wife, Alice, have two young sons. So I think he said uh, six and nine. Six and nine, yeah. And they also enjoy water skiing, hiking, and traveling together. My wife Suzanne and I have had several opportunities to go uh, and attend concerts at White Concert Hall in Topeka on the Warspring University campus and we'll be there several times this year in 2015-16. Suzanne is also a member of the Symphony League Board there for the Symphony. Support for the Symphony has grown through the years in addition to hundreds of patrons who annually contribute to the Society. An endowment fund was created in 1990. Since then, over $1 million have been raised to ensure the symphony's future, Topeka. You have brochures on your tables, and I do hope that you'll take advantage of those and find time to attend one or more of the concerts in Topeka at White Concert Hall. One hour away in a great concert hall to listen to excellent symphony orchestra. It's my pleasure to present Kyle Wally Pickett. Thank you very much, and, and good afternoon. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak to your club today. I'm, I'm very happy. I always enjoy speaking to Rotary Clubs as a fellow Rotarian, and it's always fun to see how different clubs do do their activities and, and, and do things differently from one another. Uh, but one thing is consistent from uh, club to club, and that is that you are all people who care deeply about your community, and you care deeply about serving uh, and giving back. And so that's, that's always a very good <coughs> crowd for me to talk to about the symphony. Um, what, I, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit um, about two things. Uh, I've, I've realized over the years of giving talks at Rotary that when questions come up afterwards, they're almost all about how do you become a conductor and what do you do as a conductor. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, uh, how you become a, a music director for an orchestra, and then tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Topeka Symphony and uh, hopefully convince some of you to come over and, and and give us a listen and, and see what we have going over there in Topeka. Uh, I, I do come from California. Um, as Dale mentioned, I'm, I'm a native of the Bay Area in California. And uh, my wife is from, from Iowa, though. And so she's been wanting us to get back to the Midwest for, for some time. And there have been some learning experiences in, in moving out to the Midwest for me. Uh, one thing was when I came to Topeka right away, I was told in no uncertain terms, you do not take sides between K-State and KU. <laughs> we are, I'm, I'm like Switzerland in that, in that issue. And in fact, I was, uh, uh, as Dale mentioned, I also conduct the Springfield Symphony so, in Missouri, so I, I split my time between Missouri and Kansas. And I was at one of the introduction events with the Topeka Symphony and someone got up and said, okay, I get that you go to, from Missouri to, uh, to, to Topeka, but you also are not allowed to ever 
ever root for Mizzou. And, <laughs> and I said, that's all right. I'm, I'm actually a Stanford grad. I'm a Pac-12 fan. I will always be a Pac-12 fan. And those people booed me. They booed me, and they booed me a lot. <laughs> and then later, as I was talking about how warm and friendly the people in Kansas are, so, someone got up and said, I'm, I'm really sorry that we booed you over that. But, <laughs> but I am a Pac-12 fan, and so I'm still riding high on Stanford's defeat of USC. That's, that's what I'm holding on to, probably for the rest of the season, I think. So, uh, so anyway, I, I am uh, very, very happy to be out here. I'm very happy to be out in the Midwest. Um, it is commonplace for a regional conductor to conduct two orchestras. And so uh, right now, for me, those two orchestras are Springfield and Topeka. Uh, there's a really wonderful synergy that happens, I think, when you're conducting multiple orchestras because so much of what we do is administrative and fundraising and so forth. And so we can really bring a lot of experiences from one orchestra to, to the other. Uh, before I came out here, I spent the last 14 years out on the west coast and I conducted an orchestra in Northern California called the, called the North State Symphony that played way up you know, close to Oregon uh, in Chico and Redding, California. And then I also conducted the Juno Symphony in Juneau, Alaska. So I commuted back and forth from California to Alaska. So really Springfield to Topeka is a pretty easy commute. That is, that is not hard com compared to what I did do. Um, but uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how you become a conductor and, and what it is I do. I mean, being a conductor is really a very strange way to be a musician, and it's a very strange way to make a living. It's a strange way to be a musician because uh, I, I spend my life doing musical performances, and I'm the only guy on stage who does not make a sound the entire time, and then I get to turn around and take the applause on behalf of the orchestra. So that's kind of an odd position to be in. So my music making is, is almost entirely what happens up here in my head, um, combined with what I feel in my heart and then expressed through waving my arms. And you know, for those of you who've been to the orchestra or been to an orchestra, you know that your view of the conductor is this, right? This, this is your view. You see the back of my head and, and, and my back. And so really, my audience as a conductor is the group of musicians, the players who sit on the stage in front of me. And so it's, a, it's an interesting path to go from being a musician to being the conductor, the person who stands up in front. And for me, it started um, back really in, in elementary school. My mother happens to be an elementary school music teacher, music specialist, um, and a piano teacher. Um, and growing up in California, you've probably heard of a proposition called Prop 13. We heard about, you know, schools in, in Kansas. Well, California led the way in destroying public education, so <laughs> hooray for, for that. Um, I call myself a Prop 13 kid. Proposition 13 passed the year I went to school, and so I actually rode a wave on the front side of the wave of budget cuts, and my sister, who was three years behind me, was on the back side of that wave of budget cuts. And of course, when budget cuts come to school, the first thing that goes is always the music program. I mean, invariably, that's the first thing that gets cut. Football is always the last thing that gets cut after math and social studies. You know, <laughs> then they'll get to football. Nothing gets football. I love, love football. Um, but the music, music program gets cut. I happen to be fortunate because my mom was a music teacher, and so as the cuts were happening, she stepped in and gathered a group of parents and said, we're going to keep music going in these schools. And so uh, they raised a lot of money privately and, and personally to make sure that instrumental music continued on at the schools. I started by playing piano with my mom. She was my first piano teacher. That lasted for a couple of years. And then she said, I think we should find another teacher for you. And it wasn't really because we didn't get along. It was probably because we got along too well. And, and so she would excuse me from practicing and playing, you know, when you have too much homework and so forth. Um, and you really need someone who, who is, am I doing something here? Just jiggle it? There, okay. Um, <laughs> hit it harder. Hit it harder. Uh, so I, I, I went to another teacher and then actually took up, uh, took up the flute as my performing instrument uh, in fourth grade. I've never, never been quite sure why I did that. I always wanted to play the trumpet, but somehow chose the flute when it was time to choose an instrument. And there's a very direct uh, relationship between my choosing the flute in fourth grade and my being a conductor today. And that relationship happens in high school when suddenly it's not really the popular thing for a boy to play flute in high school. Which is funny because I actually always tell people today, you know, playing flute in high school meant I got to sit with the girls. I didn't have to sit with the sloppy guys in the trombone section in the back of the orchestra. But still, that didn't really matter. And, and 
Um, we had a no orchestra program in our high school, so yeah, trombone player over here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there's an adage among conductors: is never look at the trombones; it only encourages them. So we, we try to try to avoid that. Uh, we didn't, you know, as I said, we had we had cuts, so we didn't have orchestras in our high schools in California. So we had bands, and we had a very fine band program. We had concert band and marching band. I loved marching band. I loved every minute of it, except for the part where I was playing flute on a football field, because the definition of futility is playing flute on a football field. Nobody can hear you for one thing. When the wind blows, you can't make a sound for another thing. And again, it's that 15-year-old boy on a on a high school football field with a flute in his hands. That's kind of a rough thing to do. And that really led me to uh, to want to be the drum major. So I became the drum major for the marching band and led the marching band. And, and that was really my first taste of conducting, was conducting that band on the football field. And uh, for a couple of years, we had a, a, a more successful band program than we did football program. That was kind of a fun thing for us. Uh, when I went off to college, I knew I wanted to study music, but I wasn't really intending to be a professional musician. Um, so I wanted to go to a university where I could study at a serious level, but also do other things. And so I, I chose Stanford University uh, for its academics, but also because it had a, a, a really outstanding uh, flute teacher. Uh, my teacher there was a woman named Frances Blaisdell, a really extraordinary woman, just passed away a couple years ago. Um, she was 96 years old. She was still teaching full time at Stanford. Uh, the year that she passed. She was the first woman to go to the Juilliard School. She was the first woman to play in the New York Philharmonic. I mean, those are significant milestones. Uh, her husband had been the principal clarinetist for Toscanini, and, and you walked into their house, and it was a veritable museum of the 20th century you know, in music. Aaron Copland, pictures of Rachmaninoff and Stokowski. And, I mean, you name them, if it's a 20th century musician, they're in that house uh, on the wall. And so my studies with Francis gave me that direct connection to some of those great geniuses of the 20th century. And my work there, I studied music and I also studied political science. I thought I might go into politics, and it turns out I did. I just happened to go into musical politics and in, in <laughs> being a conductor. And so when I was a senior, I went to Francis and I said, you know, I'm, I decided I'm going to go on in music. And she said, are you going to be a flute player? And I said, no. And she said, okay, good, that's fine. And uh, I was a little bit offended, but she said, uh, no, go on, be a conductor. That's, that seems to be, that's, that's your fit. And so I went on and studied conducting at, at the graduate level. Um, learning how to conduct is a, is a difficult task because conducting, the mechanics of waving your arms is the very smallest aspect of it. I mean, that can be done in front of a mirror very easily, but conducting is really a matter of learning music, learning the, what's on the printed page, making the decisions, having the vision for that music, and then getting a group of people to go along with your vision and put it together in, in the way that you all, uh, or that you as the conductor decide to lead. And so to learn how to do it, you have to practice it with a lot of people. And so I was fortunate to go to a conservatory, at Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, where they had a dedicated orchestra just for the conductor program. So we had 80 people who would sit there twice a week for us and play as we studied and practiced our craft with our teacher right behind us. And this was a fairly uh, unusual program. I think it was unique at its time. There are a couple other conservatories that now have programs like that, but I was very fortunate to work at, at Peabody. So that's sort of the nuts and bolts of how you become a conductor. The what you do as a conductor um, about 10, 20% of what we do is musical, and that's in our rehearsals with our players and, and our performances. And then the other 80% is all administrative and things like this. We're raising money, we're raising awareness, we're, we're advocating for the orchestra, and we're advocating for music in our communities. That is really what we're doing as, as a music director for an orchestra. So I want to tell you, I have a few minutes left, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on with the Topeka Symphony. You know, our cities, Manhattan and Topeka, are, are not that far apart, certainly not by a Californian standards where we drive an hour to just about anything. And uh, I know some of you have seen the Topeka Symphony, have come over to see us. Some of you saw us up in Marshall County when we played at the Oregon Trail uh, last month. 
Um, and I would love to urge you to come over and see a little bit of what we have going on and also tell you that one of my goals for the Topeka Symphony is actually to get us out of Topeka and all across Northeast Kansas. We've actually had some talks already at McCain. We're hoping that sometime in the next year or two we're able to bring the symphony here to Manhattan. I'd love to do that. Um, but again, I'd love to have you come out and see us. We are a, a professional regional orchestra. And I like to make that distinction to people. People often ask, you know, are, are your players paid or are they volunteers? We're a professional orchestra, but our players don't make their full living playing with the Topeka Symphony. I mean, for that, you've got to get up into the ranks of, you know, Chicago, New York, you know, Philadelphia, even Kansas City. You know, you can make your living doing that. So our players make their living by freelancing among a number of orchestras, teaching students privately, teaching in the schools. They're, they put together a living. Most of them are professional musicians or pre-professional musicians, conservatory students. Um, some of them, uh, music is their avocation, but they play at a level that they can compete for a professional job. They are paid for everything they do. So every time we have a rehearsal, every time we have a performance, those players are, are paid. We are entering our 70th year as an orchestra. We made the transition that most orchestras do from a community orchestra, a volunteer fun orchestra that, that became eventually over the years a professional orchestra. Uh, we play about seven subscription concerts a year. I say about because it varies from year to year a little bit. About seven subscription concerts a year, and then a number of other performances as well. We have a board of directors who are community folks from the Topeka area and the region. We have a small staff of administrators who help keep things going, and that's, that's basically how a professional regional orchestra operates. Uh, so we do a seven concert subscription season. We do school days concerts. We do uh, several concerts for kids um, in in Topeka. Uh, kids come from Topeka. Do I have to hit this harder? To, yeah. Um, come from Topeka and the surrounding areas. And on that day, we usually reach 5,000 students and give them an introduction to seeing live performances by the orchestra. Something I'm very, very proud of in the Topeka Symphony organization is we have three youth orchestras under our organization. So we have an elementary school orchestra, we have a junior high aged orchestra, and we have a high school aged orchestra. And the students in those orchestras come from all over. They come from all over Northeast Kansas to play with us. Um, this is a really important part of the mission of what we do because in addition to our performing mission, we have an educational mission. And I'm gonna stand on my soapbox just for a moment here and say, you know, you are suffering from budget cuts in Kansas to, to your education. Um, we are so concerned these days with test scores and achievement among students in our schools. We want them to score better and be competitive in math and in science and, and in, in English and language arts. If you want your kids to do better in school, if you want their scores to go up in math, if you want their attendance to be better, if you want their behavior to better be better, put an instrument in their hands. It is settled science. They have studied program after program and institution after institution. When kids have access to music, and not just music, but art and theater and dance and sports and all the things that, that we think of as being add-ons to the academic work, if those things are central to their academic work, their academics excel as well. And so, Please, you know, there, we, we do what we can, but every time I talk to a group, I say, advocate for continued funding for arts education in your schools if you want to see your, your kids thrive. Um, there's so much more to talk about, but I really don't have much time, and I would like to take a couple questions if, if we might. I, I would say this, uh, the Orchestra on the Oregon Trail program that we started uh, up in uh, Marysville, up in Marshall County, uh, last month was a wonderful event. It was, um, it's something that I think we're going to continue from year to year. Uh, it's an outdoor festival. It's a, sort of like what happens with the Kansas City Symphony when they come over and do Symphony on the Flint Hills, uh, but it's very place specific up there on the Oregon Trail. Uh, we had a great turnout. There were bands throughout the day and then the symphony played that evening and we're really looking forward to doing that again. I hope you might come out to that. And our season starts next Saturday, a week from Saturday. Uh, and we're going to be playing wonderful music. You know, we play the traditional symphonic repertoire, Beethoven, Brahms, and Mahler, and Rachmaninoff, and so forth, and we also do Pops concerts, and we do Christmas concerts, and we do a variety of things, and so 
I, I know we have spread around some brochures. If, you have, or if you're interested at all in that, take a look and see what we have to offer. I think you'll be really uh, very pleasantly surprised at the level of professionalism, the level of performance that you can see. Uh, and White Concert Hall over at Washburn University is a really terrific place to see musical performance. It is, it is one of the best halls I've ever played in. It's very intimate and you feel very close and very connected to what's going on. So come out and see us um, and then we'll try to come over and play right here in your community. Thank you very much. Any, any questions? Anything anybody would like to ask? Trombones versus flutes, those kinds of things? <laughs> yes? I do. I do still keep it up. I, 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 I do it in a very dumb way, which is I, I don't practice as regularly as I should because I, I definitely was a performer before I you know, went into conducting. And, and my teacher had said, play all the time. And so now what I do is three or four times a year when I perform, I have to get into shape and it, it hurts and it's no fun. And then I say, after I perform, I say, oh, I'm going to just play a couple times a week and then I don't and I have to do it again. <laughs> I do play the piccolo also. Uh, I do play the trio for the. <laughs> can well? I can play it well. <laughs> I, just, I just mentioned that because every flute player, I love to hear that piccolo part. It's an incredible effort, and I know I can do it, and I know you do. Yeah. Yeah, it goes. It goes like that. Um, actually, I'm going to tell you a funny story. This is a different. This is a Midwest issue versus a California issue. Um, last week and a half ago, we were having auditions for a new piccolo player for the Topeka Symphony. The position was won by someone from from Manhattan. And I should mention, we have about a dozen Manhattan musicians who come over and play in the Topeka Symphony. We had auditions. This was at Washburn. This was the night of the storm where we got four inches of rain over there, and we were having, aud our auditions are blind auditions, so there's a screen set up and the player plays behind, so we don't know who is playing uh, to keep it very impartial. And um, the audition's going on, and suddenly the Washburn marching band bursts in. It's those trombone players again. The, the Washburn marching band bursts into the hall and interrupts this audition. This poor gal was trying to do her audition. Turns out the tornado sirens were going off. You can't hear tornado sirens when you're listening to piccolo auditions. That is something that actually will wipe out a tornado siren. So piccolo does do that. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Please come see the Topeka Symphony, and we'll, uh, we'll hope to, to see you soon.